everyone to our lightning talks session. Um, I have a few brief introductory remarks, and then we'll kick off what will be a very um, busy and full um, lightning talk session. Um, we have had a slight change to the order of the speakers, so I'm putting the new um, speaker order in the chat now. Um, let me start by just sharing um, a few um, brief um, bits of information about the um, about the conference, uh, some general conference information to get us started. You're at FORCE 2023, the annual conference of the FORCE 11 community. Um, we're here to talk about the future of research communications and e-scholarship. Um, we're a membership organization of individuals working together to make positive changes in scholarly communication. Um, membership is free, and if you're not already a member, you can check out our website for instructions on how you could join. Um, we are grateful to the sponsors that have made um, the, this event possible. Um, thanks to all our sponsors. And um, some technical details that all of these sessions are taking place by Zoom and recordings will be made available after the event. Um, conferences avail information is available on our website, including the code of conduct. Um, you're also welcome to join discussion on the Force 11 Slack. And if you will be um, posting on social media about the conference, um, the hashtag is Force 11 conference. Um, mark your calendars for the, our next upcoming event, um, FISCI 2023, um, the Scholarly Communication Institute taking place July 31st through August 4th. This is an online event as well. Um, and registration is now open. We do have a full um, agenda of lightning talks today, um, which means I'm going to be keeping a close eye on the time and we'll be taking questions in the chat, probably only. It's unlikely that we'll have time for Q&A um, before um, it is time for the next talk to start. Um, what I will be doing is um, at, each speaker has 10 minutes at, um, while the speaker uh, begins to speak, I will have my camera off. At eight minutes, I'll turn my camera on. There's no need to flinch when I <laughs> appear there, but um, I will be giving a signal then at nine minutes with the um, yellow signal and at 10 minutes with the red signal. And then at um, 10 minutes and 30 seconds, there will be an actual lightning bolt um, that will bring your conclusion to a talk. No, I'm kidding about that part, but we will need to move on um, to, the, to the next speaker to make sure everyone does get a chance uh, to present today. Um, thank you so much for preparing these wonderful talks and for participating um, with us today. Um, again, there was a slight um, change to the order of, this, of speaking. So our first talk um, will be um, charcoal burning in Zambia user narratives for successful and equitable information services. Um, and that um, talk will be given by Brian Bales of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, and um, Brian, are you ready? You, um, good. Um, I'm ready, yes. Welcome. Thank you. So shall I go ahead? Yeah. OK. OK, hopefully it's all working. So I just wanted to talk about something I'd noticed and uh, want to put into practice. And I don't know, maybe many of you are doing it already. And it also helps you know, to get your ideas down on paper. So I, I thought I'd explore this idea a little bit. So the International Nuclear Information System, it was founded in 1970, and it was an example of Cold War cooperation between the US and the Soviet Union. And it quickly grew and now has 132 member states that contribute scientific literature. 
It has information not just on nuclear energy, but nuclear inf medicine, like imaging and cancer treatment, preservation of cultural heritage objects using nuclear techniques, soil remediation, and so on. And maybe one application that's interesting are, is PCR tests were originally done with nuclear techniques, but they've since uh, evolved. So we have a lot of information on that evolution. So Ennis was really designed for research by nuclear um, scientists of various kinds. But in the last 10 years or so, we've opened it uh, to the general public through Ennis Repository Search, our repository. So just some of the numbers that we have, we have 4.6 million bibliographic records, 2.1 million lead to full text. We have 600,000 full text PDFs that we uh, host here. And we have 2.1 million visitors last year. And pretty much every country on in the earth um, has visited. We've had users from in the year at one point. So looking at Google Search Console, I started to notice that we would suddenly get all at once a relatively large number of long and very similar queries, and all from the same country in one or, or a couple of days. For example, how is carbon-13 used in medicine? Or what are methods for detecting heavy metals in water? Or in this case, what is the environmental effect of charcoal burning in Zambia? Now, looking at that particular query, you can see that there were over 250 searches like that, where, where we were presented to the user in Google, and then 50 people clicked on the link to our repository. And all of these queries were from a single country of Zambia. So you can probably suppose, as I did, I suppose, well, this is a, uh, from a school assignment. And having lived for a few years in the neighboring country of Tanzania, and having seen both the charcoal vendors selling charcoal and, and also having visited a, a few schools, uh, I started to wonder, how are we really serving this community of users? And it really piqued my interest. So um, we could also tell, by the way, in, in uh, Google uh, Search Console, that the users were led to this particular paper, which is a publication of the Stockholm Environmental Institute and given us to, by Sweden back in 1994. And it goes into great depth about this topic. Now, given all of this information, we can then begin to construct some ideas about the users and their experience. First, I wanna make clear that this isn't a user story. A user story is more of a, a formal thing done in, in software development, as you can see here. I, I won't read it out to you. Instead, I'm talking about user narratives. And a user narrative, as the first quote says, describes a particular person's fictionalized journey through the use of your product. It reads like a short story, and most user narratives are between 50 and 50, uh, 500 and 1500 words. And Jack Dorsey, the, the uh, former head of Twitter, said that if we do that story well, all of the product, all of the design, and all of the coordination that you need just falls out naturally. And I thought, you know, we could use this to see how we're serving underserved. Uh, populations like like perhaps this one. So I started to construct a user narrative that says, I'm a 14 year old student in Zambia. I was given an assignment at school to write a one, a one page paper on the effects of charcoal burning on the environment of Zambia. I use my and then I, I stopped for a minute, I use my what. And so I looked up uh, mobile cellular subscriptions for 100 people in Zambia. There are 104 mobile cellular subscriptions per 100 people. So most people have cell phones and, and many of them have smartphones. I know in Tanzania, you would do so many transactions by cell phone, even by text, pay for things. And, and it was almost like a savings account. The percentage of people uh, using the internet is growing by leaps and bounds and it's getting up to 20%. So I would suppose then that a person used it on a, either a school computer perhaps or mobile. But I thought I'd assume that they 
use my mobile phone. So I went on. I used my mobile phone to search for that very phrase in Google. I clicked on one of the links, and it took me to a PDF in the Innis repository. So that's just a, a small uh, bit of the user narrative, but it's kind of a summary of it. So then I thought, well, I will see what their experience is like. So here we can see what it looks like on a, their, their journey looks like on a mobile phone. On the left, they went to Google, and we're the second link. And it says SEI EED 33. It doesn't look very well formatted. If you try to open the, the PDF then on, mo on a mobile phone, it also is a bit difficult to, uh, to handle. And then if you uh, go down on the PDF, then you have to go through all this text to get the answer that you want. The answer that they wanted was, what is the environmental effect of charcoal burning in Zambia? And we pre pre presented them with a PDF. Is that what they really uh, want and what they need? And it does that best serve the user? I really don't think it does. So I came to some conclusions. First, this, this audience of users wants an authoritative, citable answer that's delivered in a user-friendly way. And I think that we didn't do that. This audience, as well as those around the world, is highly dependent on mobile platforms. If you look at the statistics, uh, mobile overtook desktop many, many years ago. And finally, the current configuration is difficult for such users. So what can we do? Well, first, we could fix the PDF metadata. If we look at the, uh, the citation in Google, I believe it came from the, from the PDF metadata that title, and then not finding any, it just derived it from the, uh, that's a report number that somebody wrote on the very top. We could do better than that. But then maybe large language models like chat GPT or some, something that we uh, embed might be a solution because it'll give a uh, authoritative answer. And now that's been a problem since we all know those to have problems with facts and making up facts. But perhaps when that's fixed, then it, it'll be a solution. Then perhaps we could convert legacy PDFs like this one to more mobile-friendly pages. And this technique of, uh, of creating a, a, uh, of a user narrative can be used for other underrepresented audiences, such as people with vision impairment. So I may do that next and see what the experience is like. So anyway, I thought I'd share this with you and hope you, you found it useful. And uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Brian. Um, really appreciated uh, that talk and the, the visuals were great. Our next um, two talks are um, sort of paired talks around the themes of metadata for everyone. Um, our uh, next speaker, will be um, exploring that theme with close reading the metadata for cultural issues. Um, and that will be Julie Shi from Scholars Portal. Um, Julie, um, are you, um, let me make sure we have you here and um, ready. Yes, there you are yes. ready to speak. <laughs> um, welcome, Julie, um, go ahead and begin your talk. Thank you. Let me just share my screen first. Um, and that should be visible to you now. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us for this talk. I'll be talking about the Metadata for Everyone project and my work on phase one of the project to close read the metadata for cultural issues. Uh, so as the project title suggests, uh, Metadata for Everyone engages with metadata through cultural lenses. Uh, and as we know, metadata has the potential to make local research visible and accessible for immediate and wider audiences in our global scholarly ecosystem. And we also know, though, that making and enhancing metadata that's considered high quality requires time and labor. And for some, this requires a much larger investment of time and labor than for others. And this is in part because systems and standards for metadata are built around the English language and Western ideas of knowledge and scholarly practice. So English language metadata, for example, is an inclusion criteria for indexing in Scopus and the Web of Science. So while metadata will ideally make research from all regions and cultures more visible and accessible, the reality is that our tools and mechanisms make it more difficult for certain communities to share, find, and access relevant information. 
And when systems and standards impose meanings that aren't appropriate or relevant, they fail their users. So with support from Crossref, we embarked on this project to understand who is left out of metadata, even when standards are perfectly applied. And given the global nature of scholarship, we wanted to see whether our current metadata systems capture this global dimension, and if so, how. And where systems and standards are falling short of their users, we're interested in the idiosyncratic ways that individuals use metadata to assert or retain their identity. So work for this project occurred in three phases, with an initial discovery phase, between the Public Knowledge Project and Crossref to establish scope and priorities and identify data sources. And during phase one, we used the Crossref API to pull a data set from the identified sources, and I manually reviewed the records in the data set to surface culturally related issues and establish a typology of common issues. And this typology has informed work in phase two to measure the completeness of metadata in relation to the identified issues uh, programmatically, and my colleague Dennis will discuss this more in the next talk. Uh, but turning to the scope and methods for phase one now. Uh, so quality can vary enormously across metadata records. So defining the scope of the search was important to make this a manageable task. And because we're interested in the ways in which individuals and communities actively seek to convey meaning and express identity, less attention was given to issues related to technical quality or aesthetic choices, such as incorrect page numbers or formatting issues clearly caused by copy pasting text. Instead, we measured quality against the possibility of harm or disservice that issues could cause to a person or group in their work. So more formally, we define cultural issues as issues that impact or have the potential to impact the representation of identities, roles, intentions, and other factors specific to social, regional, or research cultures. And this definition is intentionally vague and broad because of the myriad ways in which culture can inflect and impact how knowledge is understood and research is conducted. And from a point of scale to make the review manageable, the final sample included 427 records that were known to have technical quality issues. And since PKP maintains the OJS Open Journal Systems platform, a subset of records were intentionally retrieved from journals publishing with OJS to see where improvements can be made in the software or its support. And for each record, I close read the record uh, and also compared the record to its associated item and landing page. And when similar issues were noted between records, I also read across records and items to see if patterns emerged. And according to Wikipedia, close reading means thinking about both what is being said and how it is being said. So in the metadata context, this translated to looking at the fields used and not used in the record, as well as how they are used, and also the content and format of values input. So within a record item and landing page, I looked at the item abstract and title, a person's given and family names, as well as their affiliations, and the publisher title, language, and subject of the containers, which were usually journals. As you might guess, a range of issues were found in this process. And one goal of the close reading was to determine if a metadata issue could be considered an issue of general metadata quality or one that pertained to cultural meaning and identity. In some cases though, the same type of metadata issue could fall under either category. So in this record, for example, the short form of associate is entered as a given name and professor is included as part of the family name. So this can be chalked up to poor data entry practices, where the first part of a name string that appears in the text is copied into the given name field and all other parts are entered as family, regardless of whether the full string is in fact the author's name. But this can also be read as an assertion that an author's title is, a, is as significant as their name. Despite these gray areas, we analyzed the final 32 unique issues, which are listed on the slide, and we're able to identify six main types of issues that often affect individual identities and cultural characteristics. And I'll briefly introduce the six issue types in this section. So starting with language issues that relate to the languages and scripts of values and their identification using language and style attributes, we have an example record for an item that's only available in Japanese. The record itself though, contains values in a mixture of English and Japanese languages and Latin and Japanese scripts. And the language of the record is set to English. So this leads to questions about why this combination of languages was used and how it actually affects how the publisher, author, container, and item are understood. Issues related to naming can also overlap or stand apart from issues with language. And naming issues consider whether individual and organizational names are recorded in accordance with linguistic and cultural conventions. So in our first example on the left, we have a Korean name input entirely in the family name field. And perhaps this is because family names are presented before given names in Korean, or perhaps there's another reason. But this name structure is also present in Chinese. And in the second example in the middle with a Romanized Chinese name, we see the common Romanization practice of capitalizing family names so that non-Chinese speakers can distinguish name parts in names that don't follow the first name, last name structure. For organizations, naming issues often involve acronyms. So in this case, on the right side, 
The name translated in English is written in full, followed by an acronym of the name in its original Indonesian, which begs a few questions. Why is the English translation given? And is the local community perhaps more familiar with the acronym rather than the full name in Indonesian? Contribution issues refer to the acknowledgement of contributors to the creation and publication of the item and its contents. So this includes authors and publishers, but also rights holders, funders, sponsors, and the like. In many cases, these issues resulted from the absence of some or all authors from a record, as was the case for the two examples on the left. And the right shows an unusual instance of a record identifying the rights holders, but also raises the question of why the Chinese organization is referenced only in English translation. Elements that can document geographic locations, which gesture to social, cultural, and linguistic positions, fall under the geography umbrella. And those elements are generally publisher location and author affiliation. Publisher locations were recorded in very few instances, and in many cases, such as with the university publisher on the right, the location and context that the journal is situated in is immediately known only to those who recognize the name IAIN Langsa. In the second case, in the middle, the regional publishing platform Sayello helps to signal the region that this publisher is from, but it still lacks the specificity, um, and the abbreviated publisher name likewise prevents this understanding. In both cases, we again ask if the universities are better known locally by their abbreviated names. On the other hand, when we encounter multinational publishers like Elsevier on the right side, publisher names and locations won't tell us much, but author affiliations could. In many cases though, author affiliations are also absent. Under the heading of seniority are stylistic and content-based interventions that may reflect the position of certain authors. And we saw one example of this already with the inclusion of associate professor in the given and family name field. To the left, we have another relatively simple case in which all authors are listed as first, and there are also cases where all are listed as additional. In either variation, there is a suggestion of equal contributions and resistance to more top-down models of recognition. The right reflects a more complex situation in which the names of faculty members are recorded in all caps, while those of students are noted in regular case, a distinction that is read as intentional because of the noticeable absence of the faculty member's title in the record, unlike in the earlier example. And the final issue type, prestige, often overlaps with seniority and geography, and refers to issues suggesting the significance of institutional representation or reputation. And this single example presents two common issues. At the top, instead of the first author's name, we have only their title as research scholar and institutional affiliation. We do have the second author's name, though, and their status as faculty and institutional affiliation is presented as an additional author of the paper. So we wonder if institutional representation or reputation is considered as significant as the individuals conducting the research or even more so, and if so, in which context and under what conditions. So these issues are derived from local practices, but what does it mean in the global scheme of things? With six main issue types found in the records in various forms, the findings confirm that metadata is in fact not for everyone. While many of the identified issues may be due to a poor metadata practice, they should not be preemptively dismissed as such. The possibility that tensions result from deliberate assertions of culture or identity because the current systems and standards are failing users should not be ignored. But the responsibility does not lie with metadata creators alone. More work is needed by journals, publishers, and technical organizations alike to understand the ways in which our systems and standards render communities, worldviews, and stories invisible, and what we can do to start addressing those gaps and obstacles. There are, of course, limitations to a project like this. For one, this review is not comprehensive, and the issues and patterns found are specific to my interpretation of the 427 records in the sample. Recognizing that an issue or nuance exists often requires a degree of familiarity with regional, disciplinary, and publishing cultures, and so there are likely things that I've overlooked or read too deeply into. And this review by itself also doesn't tell us anything about the reasons behind the issues. Understanding which issues result from poor metadata practice and which result from deliberate interventions is critical to determining what needs changing and how changes should be made. And building on these findings, phase two explores the extent to which the types of metadata issues identified in the study are present in the scholarly record. And I'll leave those details to Dennis to share. And a quick thanks to the team. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Julie. And we look forward to hearing more about this metadata uh, for everyone project um, as uh, Dennis Donathan um, presents to us um, programmatic analysis of Crossref metadata. Um, glad to see you here, Dennis, and um, go ahead and begin your presentation. All righty. Yes. Share. All righty. <clears throat> so, uh, as mentioned, uh, I'm Dennis Jonathan, uh, and I'll be talking about the 
uh, second phase of <clears throat> our Metadata for Everyone project, and Julie introduced it really well, so I'll we'll just dive straight in. So for the second phase, we kind of had a <clears throat> this kind of broad uh, research question to drive it. How do language of publication and publish publisher size affect metadata quality and completeness? And from that, there's kind of three sub-questions. To what extent are multilingual records present in Crossref, and uh, what uh, size publishers publish the most? Do non-English and multilingual publishers have <clears throat> uh, more or less complete metadata? Uh, and which fields differ the most? And then <clears throat> to what extent are there differences in the quality of metadata <clears throat> of the records from non-English and multilingual publishers? Uh, so we went about this by gathering uh, about 106,000 records from the Crossref API, specifically those that are uh, the journal article type. Um, and then we'll eliminate the duplicates and uh, items that are mislabeled, ones that aren't actually uh, journal articles, strip white space, XML tags, and so on. And that left us with 100,000 records. Then we go through and detect all of the issues, you know, fields where there are values missing, um, and some of the uh, issues uh, that Julie found, we Im implemented those uh, programmatically so that we could detect them in this larger sample. And then we would label those accordingly when we see something that's wrong. Uh, additionally, we detect the languages within each of the records. And then we also label the records according to the size of publisher. So we'll start to what extent are multilingual records present in Crossref and what size publishers publish the most. As I said, we went through and uh, scanned multiple fields within each record to determine what language was being used. And then we ended up grouping them into three categories, English, monolingual, excluding English, and multilingual. And on the left, you can see the breakdown where English occupies uh, close to 85% of our sample, multilingual about nine, or monolingual about nine, and multilingual uh, about 6%. As for who's publishing them, and we have 5,639 unique publishers. And of that, 2,922 publishers only have a single record in the sample. So we went ahead and grouped them based on uh, their representation within our sample. So the smallest group has 75 or fewer records within our sample. The next 76 to 1,000, then 1,001 to 5,000, then 5,001 to about 10,000, which that group is only Springer and Wiley. And then the final group is just Elsevier and they had about 19,000 records. On the right, you can see kind of the breakdown of the language types between the publisher sizes. Uh, and we can see that the smallest group uh, has the largest share of multilingual and monolingual non-English records, uh, which they combine to represent about 32% of all of those records within that group. So do non-English and multilingual publishers have more or less complete metadata and which fields differ most? We picked a few fields from the article, uh, title, abstract, author, and language to look at. Uh, here in these charts, uh, blue means that there is a value in the field. Orange, pink means that there is not, that it's missing. Uh, and across the three groups, we see that uh, pretty consistently, abstracts are missing a lot, uh, but most in English ones. Uh, at about 85% of English records do not contain an abstract. Uh, whereas in multilingual, that goes down to 73%, and monolingual is at 78%. Uh, author numbers are about the same. <clears throat> the biggest difference for us that we looked at was uh, the language field, where uh, the language of the <clears throat> record is stated. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and we can see that English records, 16% do not state the language. But that jumps up to 38% for multilingual records, do not state the language, and then all the way up to 44% of these records uh, for monolingual do not state the language of their record. Uh, to drill down a little bit more into the author category, because the author field contains these subfields, uh, given name, family name, ORCID, affiliation, and sequence. Uh, we can see that given and family are uh, generally pretty present. Uh, and that nobody, uh, no one's orchids are, or, you know, very rarely is an orchid uh, posted. Uh, what's most notable here is the difference in affiliation, where 
uh, 78% of English records don't have, uh, or 78% of <laughs> authors of English records don't have their affiliation list, list listed. Uh, and then that goes to 83% for multilingual uh, authors, and then all the way up to 91% for monolingual uh, non-English authors. <clears throat> to what extent are there differences in the quality of metadata of the records from non-English and multilingual publishers? So kind of like Julie was talking about when we talk about the metadata quality, it's really does the value in a field match what is expected? And some of the things we looked at is, is an affiliation being listed as an author instead of uh, being placed in the affiliation field? Are there multiple languages pres present within a single field? Uh, the language used in the record doesn't match the stated language within the record. And then, <clears throat> uh, sorry, uh, inconsistent translation and or transliteration practices. And then uh, all authors uh, in the sequence field are either listed as first authors or as additional authors. So here we can kind of see the interaction between publisher size and language type. And we can see that across publisher sizes, both the multilingual and the monolingual uh, non-English records uh, tend to have more of these uh, kind of quality issues. <clears throat> uh, specifically, for the most part, it's the multilingual ones where we see the uh, kind of consistently more of these uh, issues, with exception of the, the monolingual and the medium-sized publishers. To give an example with uh, author names, uh, Kim and Cho in 2013 uh, looked at various forms of anglicized uh, Korean author names. Uh, they found that there are 24 different formats. Uh, specifically, there's six different ones that are used for <clears throat> uh, given names. So we took uh, their uh, kind of uh, framework there of the different name types and looked within our sample for how many of those name types we could find. We found five, um, uh, the, where the given name and given name are hyphenated. Uh, they're concatenated, but the second given name is lowercase. Uh, initials only. Um, the given names are separated by a space. And then they're concatenated again, but <clears throat> this time the uh, second given name is capitalized. Uh, here you can see that there's a pretty, uh, a decent spread of how these author names are represented. Specifically, there's three types that are used pretty prominently and the other two, not so much. Uh, kind of what this showcases is the, um, this tension between uh, kind of um, a rigid <clears throat> metadata schema versus a cultural uh, norm and influence. You know, how do we represent our name within the fields that we're given. Uh, <coughs> and so those are kind of the conclusions here, is metadata is labor. It's, it's a lot of work to do. And small publishers and publishers publishing in uh, not exclusively English bear a higher burden of that labor. <clears throat> and then there's that tension, like with the Korean name variations, where when you're entering a kind of a rigid metadata schema, you have to make a decision on how you want to be represented within that schema. And the problem therein lies is if, you know, if we're making that on an individual level or even a small publisher level, it might not be consistent across other publishers. And that leads to um, more ambiguation, uh, less ability to, of discovery and so on. <clears throat> and then, Finally, the lack of multilingual support. There are fields, namely like the abstract field, that was pretty common for multilingual records to have their abstract written in uh, multiple languages. Uh, however, there's no real support for that. There's not a translated abstract field or an ability to annotate what language this abstract is. There's just the singular language field, which that singular language field in, is inherently biased against multilingualism because you can only list a singular language uh, so all of these things kind of culminate in a way that, <clears throat> um, as I said, put a kind of a higher burden and kind of force these inconsistent practices in metadata. Uh, 
yeah, so that's that's gonna be it for me. So yeah, thanks to all the team, especially Julie, because uh, she uh, did a lot of work and you know, phase two used a lot of uh, the work she did and things she found in order to uh, kind of take it and apply it on a larger basis. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Dennis. And uh, again, thanks to Julie. This was a fascinating um, project to learn about um, from both of your perspectives. Our um, next speaker um, will be uh, Peter Craker of Open Knowledge Maps, talking uh, to us about Open Knowledge Maps, how to build a global discovery infrastructure. Um, welcome, um, Peter, and um, you are uh, welcome to begin your talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to present um, the global aspect of Open Knowledge Maps to you today, um, but I also want to recognize that these slides were co-created with the Open Knowledge Maps board colleague, uh, Maxi Schramm. Yeah, the motivation for our work, I think, is very well summed up in this image. Um, there are just too many research outputs, too many publications so that we can read them all. And this was created in the specific context of the pandemic, but I think we all feel often like these people in the boat in that we're just um, overwhelmed with all the literature and the other types of outputs out there. Uh, I think another learning um, that especially hit home in the pandemic is that uh, interfaces like this one are not able anymore to give us a, significant, uh, a useful overview of, for example, 200,000 results. Yeah, all of this um, uh, is the, our challenges that we're looking to overcome with Open Knowledge Maps. Um, we're a charitable nonprofit organization for those of us who don't know us yet. We're dedicated to dramatically improving the visibility of scientific knowledge. And we wanna do that um, on the one hand for uh, the stakeholders within science and academia, but also for everyone who is um, outside of that, because they often have a much dif more difficult journey into this knowledge um, ahead of them. The um, core concept behind open knowledge maps are knowledge maps. Um, unsurprisingly, in our interpretation of a knowledge map, you have a uh, topic like heart diseases, and then you have uh, these uh, sub areas represented as bubbles or circles. And um, for each um, sub area, you already have resources related to it, so you can get immediately started. Um, from theory to the practice, if you go to our website, openknowledgemaps.org, you can create a knowledge map of your own. Um, you can choose between two integrations, BASE and PubMed, and then type in uh, any topic um, of your interest. Um, and we will then create uh, the knowledge map for you. Looks very similar to the example that I just showed you in that these bubbles are the subtopics. And then once you've identified an area that you're interested in, you can then zoom into it. You can see the um, papers and outputs related um, to this particular subtopic. And then um, you can also inspect the metadata um, and read um, open access uh, papers directly within the interface. The advantages that this brings is that it gives you a bird's eye view of the field, which is really difficult to achieve um, with other measures. You can identify relevant concepts, learn about the terminology of the topic of a field, which is often the most difficult step um, in any discovery process. Um, the clustering also allows you to sort the relevant from the irrelevant, depending on your information need. And uh, finally, Open Knowledge Maps is an interface over all scientific knowledge, both open and closed. But we always make it very easy to um, access the open content and we also uh, integrate uh, additional services for it. Yeah, we have um, seen quite um, a lot of adoption, especially uh, within 
the last one and a half and two years, um, you can see there is a sort of elbow here that indicates um, uh, the exponential, the start of the exponential growth phase um, that we're still in. So now more than 1.5 million knowledge maps have been created. Um, and right now, um, a new knowledge map is created every 20 seconds. Yeah, with that out of the way, um, let's talk about the global aspects. Um, our ambition is to provide an overview over all scientific uh, knowledge, um, independent of language, geographic region, or output type. This is, of course, um, a goal that you can never really reach, but I think for us it really serves as a very useful ambition. So what are the steps that we've taken towards that goal? So um, we uh, currently um, have a knowledge base over 300 million outputs from over 10,000 10, sources from all around the world, thanks to our three uh, aggregators that we use, Base, PubMed, and OpenAir. Um, we uh, in, uh, provide support for 25 output types, um, including preprints, data sets, um, software, so all the cool stuff that open science is giving us, um, but that is in many cases really hard to discover and retrieve. And finally, um, we're one of the few AI-based tools out there that doesn't put a restriction on languages. Um, so you can, for, for example, searching all the more than 400 languages that base indexes. It doesn't mean that the results will always be um, sort of the same quality, but we're taking active steps towards improving knowledge maps um, for all languages out there. Yeah, and with that, we really want to lift this veil of research that is hidden at the moment, because a lot of discovery products out there, and most users don't realize that, um, they actually take away a significant share of what is actually available. And um, that's why I'm also calling this an invisible veil, because, yeah, we don't know that we assume if we enter something into, uh, for example, Google, that we will get the full picture, but we simply can't. Yeah, this was a lot about data and technical stuff, but of course you can't be a global search engine without bringing everyone to the table, and that um, is um, summed up in this slide. So we have a participatory approach, which means that there is also co-creation with the community. Um, we give two thirds of our technical roadmap away um, to the community, um, one third to supporting members and the second third to the wider community and only the last third stays with open knowledge maps. But with this, we really hope to achieve this equitable uh, balancing of stakeholder needs. And um, I think where we're really closing the circle here is the last part, is the easy integration in community infrastructure. And this is a concept that we call the custom services. This is something that was strongly requested by our community. And the idea here is that you can embed, embed open knowledge maps in your own discovery systems and any other systems that you may have. You can set individual parameters um, and also restrict knowledge maps to your own data sources. Um, custom services are available as a cloud solution, so you don't have to install the open source software yourself. Of course, you're very welcome to do that as well. Um, I'm going to actually do a live demo. Um, this is the integration in the GoTripper platform, the outcome of uh, the Tripper project, which uh, built a uh, discovery platform for the social sciences and the humanities. And you can type in uh, a research topic here. Let's again take digital education as an example. And with, as with many discovery products, you are greeted with the familiar list-based view that gives you an overview of the resources that are um, available for this topic. Um, but apart from the list, you can also then uh, create a knowledge map that is now based on the outputs um, that are indexed in GoTripper. And I think give you a very different use case and understanding of what is indexed in this platform. And also, um, yeah, I think we can see a very social sciences and humanities driven view here. 
Um, yeah, from the technical setup, um, so we ask our partners to send all of the data to the to aggregators, uh, base or open air. And once that is done, we can then basically take those uh, components off the shelf and um, integrate them in your own offering. Um, other use cases that I will only mention briefly is that, of course, you can also integrate this into a library catalog like uh, here at ETH Zurich. You can also use that in a research data management uh, software, uh, research data archive like Auster. And you can also use it to highlight, for example, core topics or research collections like here at the University of Lausanne. All of this is based on community-based funding. Um, I mentioned the voting procedure earlier on. These are the 25 supporting members. These great organizations already support us. But of course, um, we would be very happy to extend that group even further. Yeah, with that, I say thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, um, just email me, find me anywhere online, or hit me up in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, very much appreciated that presentation. Uh, our next speaker uh, will be Arturo Garduño Bagania from Pre Review. Um, Arturo will be talking about equity and funding, uh, challenging bias in grant review processes. Um, Arturo, I see you're there, you're ready. Um, please go ahead and um, begin your presentation. Thank you. Just prepare here. Um, great. Well, so let me just uh, continue. Wait. Uh, hello, and welcome to this uh, lightning talk on equity in funding, challenging bias in the grant review processes. My name is Arturo Gardoño Magaña. I live in Mexico City, although I am connected right now from Buenos Aires, Argentina. So, greetings from one of the southest places in the continent. Uh, apologies if you hear some background noises. Um, I'm currently working as Open Ground Reviewers Program Manager and Trainer at ProReview. And in this talk, I will be discussing how bias at grant review processes have led to a lack of diversity in research perspectives and insights. Um, I'll also be sharing uh, slightly the previous experience in implementing and facilitating the equity centered trainings uh, to help ground reviewers challenge their assumptions about what makes a successful research project. Grant funding is fundamental, of fundamental importance to researchers, many of whom see this as one of the most important factors in their research career. As we see in this report, um, respondents identified the following factors as contributing most to overall career success from a list of 12 options, including uh, getting published in respect, respected journals, being highly cited in res respected journals, securing grant funding, and general research teaching or administrative work. But there is no secret that uh, historically marginalized communities have often been excluded from funding opportunities due to these, uh, these systemic barriers. This lack of funding has led to a significant gap in research perspectives and insights, as many important voices have, left, left, have been left out uh, of the conversation. Um, on screen, we can see an example of this issue in the form of some figures of a commentary published on CELL, where we can see that racial disparity in funding is real. And if we want to achieve diversity and inclusion in innovation and creativity in research, well, a series of variables have to be implemented and enforced. In the same report presented a couple of slides ago, um, we have also identified that 78% uh, 70, 70, of respondents uh, strongly agree or agree at some degree with the statement that peer review of grant uh, applications is the best method we have to ensure that we are funding the best research. Unfortunately, and grant review processes, like any other assessment process, are not immune to bias. Biases can include unconscious assumptions about what constitutes quote, good research, uh, which can be influenced by a reviewer's personal biases and experiences. Biases can also include systemic issues, 
such as favoring well-established researchers over those who are newer or from underrepresented communities. Some additional examples of bias in the grant review process include reputation, ethnicity or race, gender, primary language and writing style, institutional reputation, country of the, the country the institution is based in, uh, or even the number of participants on a research project proposal, uh, just to name a few. Bias come in different shades and shapes, but their origin is related to a large systemic beliefs that have been baked, forged, and inherited in our society throughout history. These are here defined as systems of oppression. Examples um, which are discriminatory institutions, structures, norms, policies, and practices embedded into our society used to oppress groups of people. And some of the examples include uh, racism, colonialism, patriarchy, capitalism, ableism, and many, many more isms. Without a doubt, bias and oppression come in various forms and widespread. And it's probably no surprise to anyone in this audience that science, grant making, and grant review are not immune to it. In fact, one could one could even argue that science and its practices have evolved alongside a history marked by oppression and inequalities and have contributed to legitim legitimizing systemic discrimination, exploitation, and at some point even extermination of entire groups of people. Even today, scientific practices continue to, th to thrive on exclusion as a measure of excellence and view label as nothing more than a commodity. This is relevant because, um, as we can see on the screen, there are documented tangible examples of the impact that different biases and these systems have on grant making and some of the multiple possible consequences. Some of these may look familiar to you or may relate to a certain point in your career if you have ever applied for a funding opportunity. Preview has been working in collaboration with the Open Research Funders Group and the Health Research Alliance to shape the Open and Equitable Model Funding Program, a framework that aims to make both the process of grant making and resulting research outputs more transparent, equitable, and inclusive. Um, on screen, you can see the cohort of organizations that are participating in the pilot of the program. One of the components of this program is the application review process, where we are trying to help the grant, the grant makers uh, recognize and address systemic biases that have historically led to a lack of diversity in research, research perspectives. Our participation has mainly focused on the development of primers, which are structured documents that contain strategic and concise information to guide funders throughout the implementation of practices or interventions in this case, related to the application review process. Examples of the developed, developed primers uh, include the strategies on the development of review rubrics, the selection of reviewers, the training for reviewers, uh, feedback for applicants, and uh, compensations for external collaborators and reviewers. All of these you can uh, access and watch the results in, on the link below. All, uh, our participation also includes the development of resources and implementation of trainings to help grant reviewers challenge their assumptions about what makes us a su successful research project. Resources include the guidelines uh, with strategies and suggestions to identify and address biases that may arise during the assessment of a, of a grant application, as well as tips and strategies on how to provide clear, constructive, and actionable feedback. Equity-centered training is also important, an important component for, to address bias in the grant review processes. Our training focuses on helping grant reviewers or has has focused on helping the grant reviewers to recognize and address biases in their decision making, including in unconscious biases and systemic biases that have been uh, that may be present in the in the review process. 
Of course, uh, we know that training is not the only solution for the systemic issues that we have identified, but it's an essential component uh, for this uh, version or, or vision of the new model of grant making program centered on equity, social justice, and open science. Uh, in conclusion, uh, we know that um, diversity and inclusion uh, are fundamental to enhance innovation and creativity in research. The grant review process plays an important role to achieve this goal. Bias uh, is um, bias is natural in every assessment process, and unfortunately, it cannot be eliminated. But we can mitigate it and control it with training and awareness in our in our organizations and by implementing strategies when in our role as reviewers are invited to participate. And finally, uh, document uh, and sharing the learnings has been essential to uh, overcome these situations and, of course, uh, continue with this, this process. Finally, uh, just to uh, express thanks to Daniela Sadeli, who helped to shape this uh, slide deck. And here you can see on screen our contact if you are interested to learn more of what we have been doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arturo. I am uh, definitely looking forward to learning more about uh, pre-review and, and your processes. Um, a wonderful presentation. And thank you for, for bringing that to us today. Um, next, we are going to hear from Sana Majduli from the International Federation of Medical Students Association. And um, her talk will be peer-assisted learning, a way to develop students' research education. Um, glad to have you here with us today and you're welcome to begin your presentation. Thank you, Jennifer. Hello, everyone. My name is Sana. I'm a medical student from Morocco. I'm representing the International Federation of Medical Students Association also known as IFMSA, and I will be presenting to you how we are fostering the development of students' research education through peer-assisted learning. So um, I think you and I can agree that research education and early youth involvement in research uh, has a lot of benefits to the students themselves and to their communities as, as it enhances their evidence-based uh, decision-making and their critical thinking. It also increases their knowledge of the topics that they work on during the research projects. It improves their soft skills such as team management, leadership, etc. Uh, but it also helps the universities to increase their uh, rate of publications and in the future to increase the number of researchers as these uh, youth involved in research tend to become researchers in the future. However, in our federation, we're asking ourselves how is research and research education really accessible to medical students? So uh, we led the global survey in uh, 2018 um, to assess the exposure of medical students across the globe to research and research education opportunities. And it turned out while 97% of the participants believe that research education is important in their medical curricula, Less than 20% of the participants agree that research education is sufficiently addressed in their medical curricula. So why, why do we have these barriers? Why do we have this lack of opportunities? We did a review of literature and uh, we have identified some of the barriers that students face. Um, the, the main ones are the lack of training and knowledge, lack of mentoring and guidance, limited access to databases, open access, lack of opportunities, lack of funding, lack of time, and lack of motivation and interest. So uh, actually in our federation, we work on um, many of these barriers, but the initiative we will be presenting today works mainly on the lack of training and knowledge. So uh, we tried to solve this problem by proposing a workshop called the Training New Research Trainers, or TNRT. It's actually a workshop that was created by a group of medical students affiliated with IFMSA. Um, it, it's a three day long workshop. It happens on site, not online, a maximum of 10 hours of daily training. It happens in English because we have students from many countries and many regions. 
The applications are open to all medical students and we select them based on their motivation, especially, and then their experience in research and uh, training. And uh, what happens is that experienced students teach their peers to become research trainers who can transfer their knowledge on research to their peers. So, so what happens is that a generation of experienced students creates a new generation of research trainers who can then who can then teach their peers and transfer to them some research competencies and then the cycle goes on and on and on. The competencies we actually give these participants who will be research trainers in the future, we can divide them to the first category, the trainers education, so they can later be able to teach other competencies to their peers like learning theories, adult learning, facilitation skills, etc. And of course, we give them research education based on, I can say, basic research competencies framework. That will be the topic of our next lightning talk uh, by my friend Lucia. So we tackle some of the topics related to research like evidence-based medicine, literature review, study designs, data collection and analysis, open science, publishing, citing, soft skills like leadership, team management, ethics, and responsible research and innovation. Uh, so far, we have organized two editions. The first one was in Istanbul, Turkey in uh, July 2022, and uh, the other one was in Tallinn, Estonia in February 2023. And in order to assess our impact on the participants, we did a self we we had self assessment scores that were collected before and then after the training, and we calculated the variation in scores for each competency. And this is how the results looked like. Look, looked like. So uh, actually, we had 15 participants from 13 countries in the first edition, and sadly, only six participants from six countries in the second edition. And uh, what we did is uh, this, ta the, this table summarized the changes of the means of self-assessment scores before and after the TNRT workshop. So blue is for research competencies, purple is for trainer skills so here you can see that the change was positive for all competencies for all editions uh it was up to for instance in this case 43 percent for scientific inquiry 42 percent for data collection uh, analysis and statistics 75 percent for publishing 63 percent for presentation skills 50 percent for feedback and evaluation and uh, we also assessed how confident the students or the participants are to deliver training sessions related to research to their peers and of course the the the, the impact was positive exceeding 30 percent um so we can conclude that the TNRT workshop increased the participants' training skills and basic research competencies. And uh, we conclude that peer-to-peer -peer education can be an innovative solution to develop medical students' research competencies to overcome the shortage in research education opportunities and to increase medical students' involvement in medical research and particularly global health research. Um, thank you so much. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask them in the chat. And of course, you can contact uh, our IFMSA liaison officer to medical sciences and research is issues, Luthia, who is also present with us today on LSR at IFMSA.org. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sana. And as you signaled, our next um, speaker is also from IFMSA. Um, and will be giving us uh, more details about the uh, basic research competencies framework, um, a systematic approach to research education. Let's welcome Lucia Perez Gomez. Um, Lucia, uh, you're welcome to uh, begin your talk. Thank you very much. I'm trying to share my screen, so give me one second. Um, Okay. So hello everyone. My name is Lucia Perez Gomez. I'm currently based in Spain. I'm a fifth year medical student here and I'm serving IFMSA. I, Sana, my colleague, already presented it to you as the IFMSA Liaison Officer for Medical Sciences and Research Issues. Um, 
So, well, uh, basically in this conference, we are presenting some part of the work. We have six standing committees in the IFMSA, and we are presenting uh, some part of the work of the Standing Committee on Research Exchange. We run the student largest uh, exchange program in the world. And we have two, two standing committees on, on exchanges, and one of them is on research, so we also work on research. Uh, my presentation is going to be about uh, the basic research competencies framework, a systematic approach to research education uh, from healthcare students. So basically, you have already like listened to my to my colleague, and you have already like listened to some things of this uh, presentation. But I will do my best not to be too repetitive. Uh, so basically, uh, research contributes to the advancement of science and uh, to the progress of society. And we in IFMSA we recognize the importance of research for innovation uh, in healthcare and society, and firmly believe that medical students everywhere should have access to research and research education during their undergraduate studies. We also have like several uh, policy documents in the IFMSA that you can look in our website uh, regarding to research. Um, so for your information. Um, so the basic research uh, competencies framework started also with the global survey that we led in 2018. And um, for your information, we are uh, like renewing this survey and we are creating a new one uh, regarding to research education and medical education. Uh, and I hope that the, the, um, the results will be out soon. So after after we did, we leave the survey, uh, we recognize that uh, global health research should not only generate knowledge but lead to action and guide policy development and improve health services. And while research is a knowledge and the the contribution of evidence based medicine, many students feel it is insufficiently addressed within their undergraduate curriculum. So students of today will be the healthcare uh, providers and global health advocates of tomorrow. It's crucial to recognize the important roles of research education in ensuring social be accountable providers. So what do we do? Uh, we said, okay, what can we do? as medical students um, and how can we uh, give these competencies to to the to the medical students and health providers worldwide in, in, during their undergraduate student studies so we a group of medical st students affiliated in the IFMSA created the basic research competencies framework uh, some things about uh, this framework right now i will explain how it was created um, but uh, it was lead in six phases. It's updated regularly, and here you can see the last version. That is the version of 2021. Uh, then we are. It's also evidence-based medicine. Uh, we use a lot of literature review to to create these competencies that we believe uh, that should be teaching in medical in in medical studies and healthcare provider studies. And it's open access for all our members and for everyone that wants to have access to it. So, which was the methodology? Um, as I said before, we we lead six phases. So, the first phase uh, was a need assessment, and this need assessment was basically um, the survey that was mentioned before. Uh, in the survey, it was not only like the percentage that we have sold to you, but also it was like some subjective information and perceptions of medical students and all healthcare students. But it was mainly answered by medical students um, about the how. Uh, research in medical curriculum is feel uh, how do they feel regarding medical curriculum how do they feel regarding research how comfortable do they feel uh, when they have to talk about research and we have to to develop a research in their in their studies and then uh, after that we develop a second phase and the second phase was the creation of an international working group so students uh, some students uh, from all over the world all the regions were selected in order to to start working on this on this uh, BRC F, uh, process and to start working creating a, a competencies framework. Mm. Then after that, uh, we started uh, working on literature review. So literature review on research, research education, and evidence based medicine in the medical curriculum uh, was developed to understand what is this. Oh my God, I'm sorry. Was developed to understand uh, like uh, what were going to be the outcomes of this uh, basic research framework. After we had all that, we develop a data analysis and interpretation of, of all the information that we have, together with the survey, together with the help of the of the working group, and and together uh, with the literature review and the information that was in the literature regarding to research, uh, the research that should be taught in medical curriculum. And the main outcome of all this work was uh, to create the basic research competencies framework. 
and to implement it in, in IFMSA and in national members organization of the IFMSA and to make it useful for healthcare students. Um, so the second, the, the next phase is, is the implementation and during the implementation, uh, what we did is to create a final draft um, of, we thought that it was relevant and um, we asked for input uh, to national member organizations. And then uh, the next phase is the pilot phase. So in the pilot phase, it was finally shared with everyone and it was also shared with some experts uh, in order to 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 have like the expertise uh, feedback uh, in in our basic competencies in, in our basic basic research and competencies framework. So the basic research and competencies framework that I will show you to you right now, um, the findings were that five main roles were identified with the specific competencies pertaining to each, uh, which are to be used as guiding principles for developing undergraduate researchers. So basically, uh, these are the basic uh, research competencies framework uh, that. Uh, we found, which were uh, in a circle, analyst, author, and investigation, and then collaborator and professional. And um, we can also see that uh, in, our, in, the, in the framework, that relevant key skills were also like found, and they were also like uh, developed uh, within the IFMSA. Uh, so, for example, we can see that in investigators, some relevant key skills include a scientific inquiry, lit literature review, clinical applicer, evidence based medicines. Then, in analysts, uh, we have a data collection, data analysis, statistics. In authors, we have CIT, in open science, publishing. In collaborators, we have partnerships, uh, autonomy, communication skills, leadership. And in professionals, we can find ethics, uh, safeguards and integrity, and good scientific practice and responsible research and innovation. So um, the main outcome of all of this is that um, then IFMSA is, is promoting this. And then they are also like working uh, through the national member organizations in each of them of these key skills. Uh, also, something that I wanted to mention to you is that um, we we evaluate our work uh, through the national member organizations uh, twice a year at least. So these are the findings that we had in the last uh, assessment that we did in March in March uh, this March 2023. So we had that the the basic research and competency framework is rated by 64 percent of the national member representative as useful, and then um, that um, 31 paid eight percent are using it and are working. Uh, are involving in at least one of the five pillars of the working research, uh, the basic research and competencies framework. So after all of this, we have the interpretation and is that I may say believe that researching the contents of evidence-based medicine is an essential skill for every healthcare professional. Understanding research and practicing scientific medicine is not inherent. Then this framework sets the base for curriculum development through a systematic approach to essential, oftentimes times neglected, research competencies and allows universities to improve their medical curriculum by increasing students' involvement in research and global health. And last but not least, we think that it will be beneficial to institutions looking, uh, looking to incorporate or advance research education into undergraduate medical education. Uh, here you can find uh, the contact information in case you want to contact us or you want to ask for us for the um, for the basic research framework in case you want to have a look at it. And I don't know if I'm running out of time or not because I just I can just see me, but I'm going to show to you super quickly. So here we can see this is the last edition that we have. We hope we hopefully will update it uh, this year. But here you can see like. How it looked like. So, a small introduction had the processes. And um, you can see that there are also like some comments. Um, here, here is more, much more developed, whatever like I have explained right now. So, thank you very much. That's all from my side. And yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Lucia. Um, really appreciated learning uh, how that um, curriculum was developed and, and applied. Um, our final presentation of the session um, will be uh, will be coming up, and we would um, like to um, welcome here um, Rosalind Zekem Dean um, from Rinda Wusima. Um, who will be uh, presenting a talk 
learning from collaboration in a local setting. Um, welcome, Rosalind. Um, Rosalind will be screen sharing, but not sharing video. So if you don't see video, that's um, working as expected. Um, please, um, you're welcome to begin your presentation. Thank you, everyone. Um, can you see my screen, please? Yes, can you someone... may want to put it in um, in slideshow mode. OK, great. Um, thank you very much. So my name is Dini Rosalyn. My name is Dini Rosalyn, and I'm going to be presenting to us learnings from local collaboration. And uh, oh, sorry, my slides. No, okay, great. So, as you all may all know, we have different types of collaboration. And uh, collaboration in this in this case is being defined as um, the act of um, partners uh, uh, or a group of people coming together to achieve a, a common goal. So um, we have different types of collaboration or forms of collaborations, and it could happen within a country. That is organizations or people or institutions within a country um, coming together or partnering for a common goal between countries uh, and uh, other aspects. So there are several reasons why um, organizations uh, collaborate. So we can collaborate in a local setting. As I said earlier, the focus of this presentation is on uh, local collaboration. So we, uh, co we can collaborate in order to gain um, local support uh, for a particular project or a particular area of interest. For instance, um, to uh, organization um, collaborating or partnering together in order to gain um, a strong support from the local community on what they are presenting. The second thing they might want to collaborate is uh, on knowledge synergies. They share the knowledge that they have uh, and um, to learn from each other so that they can have a good um, uh, um, how could um, with the project they want to build on existing research? So, for instance, another, another organization has been implementing a particular project in a particular in, in a country, and then another organization or another partner or person has, um, for instance, funding for the same idea. They won't go to start from scratch. They, uh, they, they will just share ideas and see how to um, complement each other and make the outputs better. And it also goes with resource utilizations and um, data methodology sharing. So today I'm going to be sharing with us uh, um, a case study from Sorry, I'm going to share with us a case study from our project, our program that was implemented in the in Rwanda here, um, as a result of the Oh, I'm sorry, I just discovered I was being less. Can someone hear me, please? Yes, I can Hello. hear you now. Um, I am not seeing your screen anymore, though. Oh, oh, sorry for that. Let me get my... Okay. All good now, thanks. Okay, so, uh, sorry. 
So as I was saying, I'm going to be sharing with us. Um, is this where you, you stop hearing me? Have I gone further? Yes, you were just starting the case study. Okay, so concerning the case study, um, as you've known, um, Ebola virus has um, had several outbreaks in uh, Africa, and the largest of it was in uh, West Africa between 2013 and 2014. And after that, we've been having several outbreaks in uh, our uh, neighboring country, Congo, especially in Goma, in the way, uh, bordering the western province of Rwanda. So with that and with the, uh, the severity of the disease, the government of Rwanda um, created a tax force and said it was better to prevent or to um, help its citizens, her citizens so that they would not um, uh, be susceptible to this disease. And as a result, um, the, 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 gov the, the Ministry of Health organized a campaign, a vaccination campaign, um, that was led by the Unified Rwanda Initiative of the National Zebulag Immunization to provide um, citizens who were at uh, risk with two shots of the Johnson & Johnson Ebola virus vaccine. So um, this program was being implemented in the Western province of Rwanda, targeting two districts, specifically um, Rubavu and Rusizi. These districts are bordering um, the, 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 the part of Congo that has been having so many um, outbreaks of Ebola virus. This project was uh, being implemented in partnership with Rinda Obuzima, where I work from. And um, Rinda Obuzima has been supporting um, the, the government to mobilize the people that were going to be uh, um, vaccinated by another organization called Project San, San Francisco. And the target was to mobilize 200,000 community members. And I would like to tell you that the, the close partnership with different um, stakeholders and organizations um, led to a, 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 a turnout rate of, a turnout number of more than um, 200,000, it was about 220,000 community members. And so uh, I would like to also say that one of our strategies that we used when we were um, implementing this program was to mobilize um, the target people to receive the vaccine as much as we could. For instance, we, we were looking at um, border crossers, people who were crossing the border on things uh, or different means, fishermen and other like. So we, we, we used different strategies such as going to the, um, to the borders very early in the mornings or in the evenings where they are coming back to make sure that we reach out to them. And so we also managed um, the recruitment process of the vaccine uh, by also always making sure that the invitations that we gave throughout the day for a particular day where we could, uh, um, um, that they don't surpass the capacity site that um, San Francisco, we worked hand in hand with the partner organization to see that everything uh, was being implemented as planned. Also, we made sure that we, we, we responded to all rumors and um, using of um, role models within the community, such as the ministries of health from the two countries who uh, um, discussed and uh, uh, inaugurated or presented the, pro the, the program to community members. And we also tried to, to provide uh, enough information while respecting the cultures and the social norms of the people in the community. So um, key facts when it comes to collaboration, it's better to provide timely and correct information. You always have to be close to the people so that you can monitor what is going on and then you address uh, 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 as they are coming. We, you also have to be in the shoes of these um, community members, try to respect their, their norms and the solution. We also try to work together with the team and do not forget um, local partnership, partner with all the uh, 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 um, stakeholders of the community, have to partner with all um, se of sectors. And um, as a conclusion, I would like to say that 
um, during partnership, we should use all rigorous uh, opportunities that are around us and um, um, uh, it will lead to a successful program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, appreciate um, your presentation and glad that you were able to be part of this session. Thank you to everyone. Um, these um, presentations were so well prepared, well delivered, and provided such valuable information. It's been truly a pleasure to be part of this session. I hope that many of you will uh, join at the, the next um, upcoming um, keynote. I'm going to share the, the link to the keynote in the chat. Um, it's been a, a pleasure to have you all here, speakers, audience, those um, asking questions in the chat. Um, and I am going to conclude this session um, to give you a chance to get to that keynote. Everyone have a great day.